Hi boys and girls, Miss Lori here for lesson two of fame. And this month we actually have two artists, which is kind of cool. Um, Courier and Ives, AKA Nathaniel Courier and James Ives. And you'll hear about them in just a minute. And our composer is Giuseppe Verde. So let's check it out. Hi, today we're gonna to talk about the art of lithograph. And it was developed in Europe in the late 1700s and was brought to the United States in the early 1800s. And Pendleton of Boston was the first one that started using it. And our artist today, Nathaniel Courier and James Ives brought the art of lithograph to the common man so people could afford it. Daniel Curry had to go to work when he was a young boy because his father died. So he and his older brother had to do odd jobs to help support the family. And when he was 15 years old, he went to work for the Pendleton Company of Boston and they were the ones that were just starting in the lithograph business. And he learned the process of lithograph and what you have to do is you have to get a stone. After they cut the stone to size and they, they had to grind the stone to get it nice and soft so they could draw on the stone. And after they drew on the stone, they had to etch it. And then they put down this, uh, they prepared this mix to put on the mix to put on the stone where they had etched. And then they put the paper on the stone and then they put something heavy on it, like a press, to press the uh, paper and then when they picked it up that you had the lithograph and in order to put color in the lithograph you had to have an assembly line for people to color the print and they would have a copy of the print in uh in color somebody had colored it in for them and they had like an like i said an assembly line and it was mostly women german women immigrants and they paid them and they sat in the line and they the first lady would get and do blue and then she would pass it down to the next lady and she would do green and the next lady would do yellow and that's how the whole assembly line went until the print was finished and then when it was dried they could sell it uh, to a lot of times they had, they had a little table outside and they could sell printed copies depending on the size for two or three cents and people would come by and and buy whatever they wanted at a really good price and I will this is the first picture that was actually printed in a newspaper and it was famous because at the time they did not print pictures in newspaper and this building had burned and uh, courier had sent a an artist out to sketch the scene and came back and within three days this was printed and of course that's you know Nowadays, we have it printed in seconds, but back in the day, that was considered fast. And, and it, the New York Sun was actually made an extra edition for this picture. Okay, and with the uh, showing of the burning of the building, the next picture that brought recognition to Courier was the sinking of the Lexington at Con Fire. And uh, again, this went to the newspaper and then he became nationally known as a printer who could print out photos for the newspaper also. And not only did they do newspaper printings, they did uh, prints uh, for the common man. They did things like disaster, sentimental photos, sports, humor, Here's another humorous one. Delicious coffee. Yum, yum. Political. A picture of George. Fishing. Here's boat fishing. Religion. Countryside. City. Trains. More trains. Ships. River boats. And actually, these river boats are racing. Race horses. More race horsing. Firefighters, the life of a firefighter. And of course, kittens. And have you noticed a little mouse in the bottom? And the cat might be afraid of the mouse? <laughs> okay, so with all these uh, lithographs going on, uh, Courier would send 
artists to different places and they would come back and have it all, you know, do it on the stones. But he wasn't a very good businessman. And his brother uh, suggested that he hire Ives to help him out. And, and Ives was kind of an amateur artist himself. So he had the vision of putting things in perspective. And so he, so as a partnership, they did really well for like the next 70 years. The interesting thing about lithograph is that not a lot of people were uh, able to sign their work. And he had various artists going out and bringing it back in and etching on the stones. And one of the one of them was a woman named Fanny Palmer, and she did a lot of the uh, the outside work. And uh, and sometimes people would just tell her about things. She had never seen a ship, but they would tell her what a ship was like, and she would draw on there. And wow. that was interesting to think about his art. Their art is because they weren't actually artists. There were other artists during helping them out, but they never had the recognition. Danny pa Palmer uh, did about 200 of the lithographs for Courier and Ives. And over the time, there, as uh, photography and printmaking and all that thing came into being, they went out of business. But they did over 7,000 prints. Whoa. Well, that's amazing and um, some of them are worth a little bit of money nowadays but back in the day they were really helped bring it forward to the common people as no other artist had done before then. So this is Giuseppe Verde and he was born in 1813 in Roncole, Italy. So this is 2021 here. Go back. 1813 is about right here a little after the railroads and the piano. Giuseppe Verde was born October 10th, 1813 in Roncole, Italy. It's a little northern town. And um, he showed musical instrument interest uh, to his parents that he wanted to play music at a very young age, at like four years old. And his mom and dad didn't know anything about music. So they paired him up with the local church organist so he first learned how to play the organ, which is right here. You can see, many of you probably know what the organ looks like, but it's got two sets of keyboards and your feet are also pumping um, the bottom as well. And then later when he learned, uh, his dad got him a small spinet, which is like a small harpsichord back in the 1800s and they kind of look like this it's a very tiny it's not portable but he kept this thing forever he loved it so much and he would practice on it all the time one time he got a little too angry that he couldn't get the chords right and he took a hammer and he was gonna smash the keys and his father caught him just in time and took it away from him so he said Anger is never the answer, which all of you know, that's very true. So when he was 12, he became so good, he took over the church organist's job, who was his teacher. <laughs> kind of funny. So at 15 years old, uh, Verde began composing music for the orchestra and also for church. And he studied with a private tutor who was a member of Milan's Opera House, very prestigious. And uh, he ended up going to a choir rehearsal and the pianist didn't show up. So he said, I know how to play the piano. So he sat down and he actually ended up playing the piano with one hand and orchestrating the choir with the other hand pretty impressive for a 15 year old. So obviously um, he took over and <laughs> became very famous. In 1836, Verde married Margarita Varese, which is fun to say. Um, and they had two kids. And unfortunately, I don't know why, but the wife and both kids died over the next four years. And then Verde actually got remarried and he didn't have any kids with the second wife, but he had all of these cool exotic pets. 
He had peacocks, he had cats, he had dogs, he had parrots. And later he died in Milan, Italy on January 27th in 1901. Uh, but he lived a very good life and he brought amazing music to the world. So I forgot to tell you when Verde died, more people attended his funeral than any other public event in Italy. That's how famous he was. So today we're going to hear a, a song called the Anvil Chorus from Il Trovatore. It was his 18th opera and he loved opera and he loved writing music for it and everyone loved going to it. In fact, he had like super fans that maybe in the winter time when it would be raining a lot and it would flood the streets a little bit. Um, his fans would come, stand in line at 9 a.m. in ankle deep water all the way to the evening to get tickets to see his opera. And that's crazy. And they would pay expensive prices to see it. And they were so good that, you know, he would get like a standing ovation and the entire last uh, act was like a giant encore. So our focus today is rhythm and remember rhythm is the beat of the music and this song the anvil's chorus happens to have a very distinct rhythm i don't know if you know what an anvil is but it was kind of a a steel piece that the blacksmith a long time ago they would make horseshoes and all sorts of things they would bang on it and you will hear that rhythm of the banging and when you hear it, I want you to raise your hand or thumbs up or whatever you want to do. Um, but I found a really cool video of this orchestra and choir together performing it. So let's check it out. It's really fun to see all of the instruments work together to create a piece of music like this. And pay attention to the percussion instruments. They create a lot of the rhythm. Obviously they're singing in Italian, that's why you don't understand them, but it's okay. Do you hear the anvil? That banging? Boom, boom, boom. See the drummer in the back? watching the composers too. I mean the orchestra leader, not the composer. So, 
For today's art project, which is inspired by Courier and Ives lithograph, we're going to need some paint, a little container for your paint, a paintbrush, paper, a pencil, maybe you might need some baby wipes, uh, inspiration for your project, and instead of using limestone, we're going to use a styrofoam plate to do your project on. And first thing you're going to do is you're going to have some kind of inspiration of what you want to draw. So you're going to draw just on the round part of your plate. And I'm just going to draw like a, just a little tree. And do it kind of make an indentation in your plate and if you go through it's it's okay but try not to press too hard you'll see and then you can just I'm just doing this really really simple just for show and I'll put a little pumpkin over here by the tree and maybe a little grass so it's something fallish and we are going to use our orange paint and uh, you have it in your little container and you spread it really thinly on your lithograph because you blob it on and it doesn't it smooshes it all around it doesn't do a very good job so this is the ink that courier and eyes would be putting on their stone Of course, theirs was black and white and not orange. If they wanted orange, they would put it on the assembly line and the, uh, the women would put the color on it for them. So after we uh, do our paint, we're gonna press it on our, this is our press, our paper. We're, gonna be, we're the press actually. So we're gonna press it down and kind of rub where you drawn you can kind of see the paint in there anyway and it can be more detailed than I did I was just this is just for show and you're pressing and pressing and then you pull up your uh, stone and you can see see how the thicker paint uh, doesn't do as good a job as when you put the thin amount of paint on there. So that's why I said just thinly put the paint on there so your project will be a lithograph. 